Daniel, did we get wet, dry, wrong? I don't know. I don't think we did. I think we did. I don't think we did. I think we did. I don't think we did. I think we did. I don't think we did. Everyone, welcome to that pedal show. Dan here. Mick here. Hello. Uh, massiveness. Le grand épice. Yeah, absolutely massive. So we're looking at what we're doing today. Did we get wet, dry, wrong? Indeed, indeed. But before we get into that, a bit of housekeeping. First of all, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And a massive thank you to anyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and grab some merch, some t-shirts and strings and pedals and all the stuff. All the stuff. Please buy stuff from there. It's predominantly how we fund this show. Indeed. Okay. Uh, yes. The Jolly big question. Good. The big question. Did we get it wrong? Yeah. Why are we asking this question? So we've been using something that we call wet dry for a long time, mm. and there's been discussions around uh, the correct terminology, and are we using that? Are we? Yeah, doing it. Are we doing it right? People get very hot under the collar because it's not proper wet dry. And just to put some context on that, proper wet dry is, um, well, you've it's got so called traditional wet dry. Yeah, well, I'll say correct wet dry. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, as far as I know, anyway, originated in studios. So what happens in a studio? In and this happens across all instruments, not just guitars, but in the in the in the 
case of guitars, you stick a mic on a guitar amp, you record it with no what we call wet effects whatsoever. So the guitar amp has got overdrive because it is overdriving. It's probably a Marshall cranked or some other guitar amp cranked and it's overdriving or it might be clean, doesn't matter, but whatever. Mic on the guitar sound and that's what you've got. In the studio, you then have access to a load of post-processing effects. So they mm -hmm. might be reverb, they might be delay, they might be chorusing. And if we think about the sort of arc of development in studio technology and mm. recording technology, those effects really start to come to the fore throughout the 70s and into the 80s. Yeah. But you think about the guy that went into a studio with his little tweed, tweed deluxe and went, eh, and some guy went, oh, we've got this new thing called a plate reverb. Check this out. You know, and then that gets added on. It's like, ah! Oh. Yeah. So at no point was that plate reverb ever coming out the front of the guitar amp. Yeah, right. What was happening was the microphone was in front of the guitar amp. The uh, signal was going off to a recording desk. And then from the recording desk, you would then take a parallel send, which would go off through the plate reverb or whatever else uh, it is you wanted to add. And that would be mixed in in parallel. So if you listen to the wet sound only, you wouldn't be hearing any of the dry sound exactly. in the parallel effect. And if you listen to the guitar amp only, you wouldn't be hearing any reverb. It was a blend of the two. Sounded amazing, mm -hmm. or could sound amazing. What then happens is, presumably, and I don't know if this is how it came about, I'm just making an assumption here. You do all that recording, you think, how on earth are we ever going to do this live? Right. So then... Electric guitar players, through the 80s especially, mm. start to use this approach where the guitar amp is doing the main sort of job and then the parallel wet effects are getting added on and mixed in rather than coming out through the same guitar speaker. Yeah. And that leads us to what we're going to get to today, which is wet, dry, wet, right? So Indeed. you have one amp in the middle that does your just your dry guitar amp sound with overdrive and distortion and all of that. And then in the outside, the two wet bits, and it was usually stereo when it when it started to happen. Because if you're going to go wet, dry, go wet, dry, wet. But you don't get any of that core sound. All you get is the affected sound mixed on top. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. So our setup today, we've got... The Boogie uh, California Tweed, and that is doing all of our dry stuff. There's no effect in that amplifier. So um, I've got everything else turned down. So Mick, if you just have a shrinkage. Now we've deliberately, or Dan, should I say, has deliberately kept the board, so say, simple today i.e. there's no additional switches or other devices. Everything you see on here is necessary for this job. Exactly. This isn't necessarily how you would do it out in the wild. This is how to explain the signal path. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. Okay, so you've turned everything else down. Turned everything else off. So at the moment, all we're hearing is the boogie in the center. Okay. Okay. And we've got the direct sound. So if you play that for a second. Please be in tune. <laughs> And we also have an overdrive pedal in front of the amplifier. Okay, so we'll kick that on. This is the HRM from J Rocket. Spectacular. Okay, so there's our amp sound. Okay. No reverb. No reverb, no nothing. The reverb and the amp is turned off. It's just, we've got a clean sound and a distorted sound with a pedal. We can crank the amplifier. We can get it all gainy from just the amplifier. Yeah, maybe we'll but do a bit of that in, in time. Yeah, but there's our core amp sound. Now, there's a bunch of different ways that we can then take that sound and affect it. We can put a microphone in front of it, put it into a mixer, take a line out, and take a send out and send that to effects. Both, can, if you want to read more about that, both Robin Ford and Larry Carton have done that. Yeah. And if you've ever seen pictures of them where they're doing a gig or whatever, and they've got a guitar amp and beside them two 
it was quite often JBL type monitors. Right. And a little mixing desk. That's what they were doing. They were putting the mic on the amp. This is remember. This is exactly how you do it in a studio. Yeah, right. kinda. Uh, you would put a mic on the amp. That would go to a mixing desk, and the mixing desk would send off to the various post effects. But in order to hear them, you need to attach two PA speakers. Essentially, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's one way to do it. You can do it with devices like um, the Ox or the Power Station, where there's a send. You know, so um, these, it comes from the speaker out of the amplifier yeah. into those devices and they're taking all of that, including the transformer, all yeah. that stuff, and we're taking a tap from there. But the, I would say the most common way to do it is the way we're doing it today and we're using the effects loop of the amplifier. So a good example of like a really early effects loop was uh, Steve Luca that had a, a deluxe modded and had to have an insert point between his preamp and his power amp. No way. Yeah. I did not know that. And uh, it was really common uh, after that point, because we had these rack effects. It's yeah. like, well, I want to take my preamp and go, uh, you know. Yeah. And then. Uh, and we, I guess we should say that the reason that that was the case was because of basic gain staging. And if you're not sure about this, watch some of our previous videos. If you stuff reverb and delay into the front of an overdrive amp, it sounds really mushy and not clean, it's yeah. not unusable because you will hear those sounds in a lot of genre of music. But if we're talking about classic rock in the way that that music was recorded, it was really important to get the wet effects after the overdrive. So Indeed. as Dan was saying, absolutely crank deluxe reverb or similar, you don't want to be shoving delay and reverb into the front of that. You want to be taking after the overdrive and sending that out to another device. Exactly. That's how effects loops were born. Yeah. So. What we've got in this case, we've got our effects loop, which sits between the preamp of the amplifier and the power stage. And there's a send and a return in the effects loop. So we take the signal from the, the preamp, that goes out and we affect it, and that goes back into the power stage. Yeah. All we're doing here is that we're splitting that signal, right? The send is going from after the, the preamp, right? And then it gets split. One side goes straight back into the power amp, so there's nothing in that loop, but the other side is basically the tap. We're taking that preamp signal and we're taking it back to the board here. Off somewhere else, yeah. Exactly. Um, probably worth, I mean, we do have some Mesa Boogie stuff here today doing the amplifying job. Mesa were pioneers in this. I think Indeed. might even have been the first company that had a commercially available um, effects loop, I think. Right. I think. Right. Um, yeah, and it, it, similarly, you'll also see direct outputs on a lot of old Mesa amps as well, presumably for, for this, this purpose. Exact, exactly that, exactly yeah. that. So, right, we've heard our direct sound, Yeah. okay? So the signal's coming back in to the board and we hit this box here and that is splitting our signal. And in this circumstance, we're splitting it three ways. Directly after the split, it is hitting a volume control. Now we've got the Ernie Ball uh, volume pedal on the board here. I couldn't fit three Ernie Ball volume pedals on, so I've got two little passive volume controls. But these three devices here are all doing the same job. You were telling me about Steve Morse earlier. Yeah. So Steve Morse would do this, but he would have three volume pedals. He would have more. You'd see him with a, you know, depending on the rig, you, you know, a bunch of these volume pedals, and it's doing exactly the same thing. It's mixing these effects in. So if you had a chorus, a reverb and a delay, for example, you'd have a separate volume control for each one. Exactly, which is exactly what we've got here. So the big Ernie Ball thing is controlling the left and right delays. Yep. And these two volume controls, which could also be volume pedals, are controlling the mix level of the reverb and the chorus. Yeah, so they're controlling the amount of signal that we're sending into those pedals, right? Yeah. Um, the volume control can be on the other side. Yeah. Um, but generally for things like delays and reverbs, we like to have the volume control on the input so we get swells. Yeah. So um, otherwise it'd be like a master volume for the effect. Yeah, it would just be, yeah, you wouldn't get any trails. Exactly. So we get trails. With having it on the, on the input of the effect, we get trails. Those of you familiar with mixing desks, this is basically your aux send level. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Then we take the stereo, so, so let's have a look at the, the delay, for, for example. 
we have a mono input to the delay controlled yeah. by the volume pedal, but then we're taking a stereo out from the delay and putting it into two channels of our little mixing desk. So this is a LAN devices uh, mixer, spectacular little thing. Yeah, so if this is confusing you, imagine a normal mixing desk where that awesome military looking thing is. Exactly that, exactly that. So we've got four channels here. I've got um, two channels going into the top channels here, and they're panned hard left and right. And then underneath that, I've got the waterfall, the jam waterfall, uh, set to vibrato only, so there's no dry signal in there. Ah, interesting. Yep. Okay. And then I'm mixing that in, and then underneath that, we've got the topanga, which is set to 100% uh, wet, yep. and mixing that in on top. So. Now, of course, you could use stereo effects for all of these. We just don't have enough channels on the mixer. Exactly, exactly that. Yeah. So we've got one stereo effect and two mono effects that we can pan yeah. anywhere in the thing. So the most important thing about this is that these effects are in parallel. None of these effects are affecting each other. Yeah. They're all uh, okay. operating independently. The delay isn't going into the reverb. The reverb isn't going into the chorus. They're all existing. They're all taking their own separate feed from the preamp signal, yeah. and then they're being mixed in, and yeah. then we can blend those in. So, so again, in a studio environment, you're basically dealing with three separate AUX send and returns. Yes. And none of that is affecting what's hitting the input. Exactly that, yeah. exactly that. So let's start with a delay. So I've just got a, a simple stereo delay set up here. As I rock the volume pedal forward, you'll hear the delay come up in the mix. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Great. Uh, and what I'll do, I will if you stick it all the way forward, then hit a, hit a chord, and I'll pull it back quickly so sure. that we can hear those trails. Yeah. As opposed to it, you know, if it was after the delay, then it'd just be like a master volume, but trails. that gives us our trails. Yeah. So we can hear that left and right imaging. Now, if we have a listen to the reverb, um, I'm going to turn the reverb up, then I'm going to pan it left and right so that you can hear the reverb effect going into the left and right speakers. And I'm just hoping I get the post-production right on this. Now I'm going to put the reverb and delay in together, and you'll hear that we're not getting the trails from the delay into the reverb. They sort of sit separately. just massive. It is huge, right? It's massive. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. And finally, we'll have listened to the, the waterfall. I've got it set on vibrato only. So our clean sound, a direct sound will be straight in the middle and the vibrato will yeah. be on the outside. Unfortunately, I can't turn the amp off manually because if I turn the amp off manually, the effects send is defeated and therefore nothing will be sent to the wet side. So this is a note to myself in the post-production that we'll play this through a few times and I'll affect the audio so that you can hear wet and dry. So you can hear that the wet is only vibrato and not chorus. Cool. Yeah? Yep. <laughs>
Mad. It's mad. It's great. Such a massive clean sound. <laughs> and that's a sound that just takes, certainly for me, takes me straight to the 80s. Straight to the 80s, especially with the chorus. Yeah. And the kind of, because of the fidelity of it, the, the boogie is set relatively clean. But you've got all that lovely high end in the, uh, in the, clean, in the clean tones. So what we'll do now, we're going to, Get, I'll get Mick to stick the overdrive on. Dan will play in a sec, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very, you know, I'm loving hearing the strap with this because it just, it literally takes me back to yeah, yeah. the first clubs I went and saw guitar players go, <laughs> oh, wow, that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, but what we'll, we'll sit the overdrive on and you'll hear that the effects are overdriven, right? So it's not just the clean sound we're getting in the effects. We still hear the overdriven sound because... The amp sound is overdriven yeah. and we're tapping off and then it's the same thing. We're taking that overdriven sound and then we're delaying that. We're hitting vibrato with that. We're adding reverb to that and then mixing those in. Yeah. What would be cool, Dan, is while I'm playing, is if you could go from like zero mix to 50% mix to all mix. Cool. Uh, in each of the effects. Yep. And then I think that will give us a good idea of relatively how wet and dry it is, as it were. That was a game. Thank you. And of course, the beauty of that is we've got that the amp in the center and adding all these effects, it doesn't change what's going on with our amp in the center. That's it. What is so interesting about playing it, we'll get down to play in a second, I'll do a similar sort of thing so you can rehear it after we've explained it. The benefit 
you know, to come back to the top, why would you want to do any of this in the first place? Why don't you just plug into your Marshall, man? Why don't you just do that? Well, because all the wet effects are really lovely. And if you listen to a studio recording of any classic, you know, band, mm. maybe ACDC <laughs> accepted. But most of the classic bands, certainly through the 70s and early 80s, lots of wetness on those guitars yeah. in a big way, actually, yeah. um, that you might not even realise long delays and reverbs and stuff. And this was a way of just doing it because the core guitar so tone remains clear. You get all the pick inflection. You get everything you want mm. to happen between you and the instrument and the overdrive. And the wet effects are just more. Yeah. And as we've proved many times on the TPS, if you just have it all coming out the same speaker, then it gets super mushy. Yeah, yeah. You there's an articulation in doing it this way that's really beautiful. Also, doing it this way with the power amp, because we're using the, the, the preamp signal from the, the boogie, the power amp's just this massive, wide open yeah. thing. And so, you know, for endless forever headroom it takes the mix of these effects and just says, well, I've got the preamp signal I've, that's going to these effects. Now I'm just going to give you all this loveliness into those outside two speakers. Yeah. OK, have a play, Dan. I'm just going to do the same thing that Dan did, uh, manipulating the effects, so that you can just get a, another listen to it and listen for some of those things we were talking about, maybe.
That's fun for days. Awesome. Well, you, uh, you you will have heard it. You will have heard just the sheer colossalness of it yeah. and certainly cranking the output of that. So if you didn't quite follow, the, the as we explained before, the two little silver knobs next to the volume pedal can uh, control the send into the chorus and the reverb, but then we've got an output volume on the mixer, so you can send maximum into them and then you can add more of them to the mix. Yeah. In general, so I whacked the chorus up towards the end there, and then all of a sudden we were literally in 1987 again, weren't we? That's brilliant. It's so cool. It's so 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 cool. I thought, oh man, it sounds like Van Halen. Hang on, I can't play Van Halen. <laughs> so that's a sort of whistle stop tour of what proper wet dry wet is. Sure. Now, what are the drawbacks with this? Yeah, why why is not why isn't everyone using this? It's a really good question, and the answer is because it's a giant pain in the ass, right? <laughs> yeah, you've got to cart all this stuff around. You need three amps worth of stage space. Um, you need to be friends with the sound engineer. Really good friends, very close personal friends. And then, the if you've got loads of um, left right effects on, the sound engineer then has a real question about how to pan that in the front of house mix. Mm. If you're doing it for recording, happy days. Yeah. Headphones, you can hear it all beautifully. Mm. Actually, as a as a slight side point, Dan, I've been surprised at the number of records I've been listening to recently, relatively modern records that have strict LCR panning. Really? So it's either in the left, in the center, or in the right. I, I really like that. Yeah. If you're at a gig, of course, Picture yourself at the gig, half a pint of warm beverage of your, you know, because it's so far to go to the bar. You're sipping it because you don't want to get rid of it quickly, but it's now taking on the heat of 273 <laughs> other bodies in the room. You're stood by the right speaker. Yeah. Because there's you have a love interest in that part of the hall, so that's where you wanna, that's where you wanna stand. <laughs> You're only hearing the right side of the delay. Yeah. Yeah. So not only is it a pain for musicians to carry around this amount of stuff, it's also a pain for the front of the house in terms of the mix. Yeah, it presents a quandary, doesn't it? And then not to mention all the technical reality of making it happen, because when it came to the four, obviously we were dealing with refrigerator size racks, which mm. is a great thing. But so in there, what would you have? Somewhere near the top, you'd have a light shining down indeed on the block of flats below and then you'd have some sort of preamp uh, a hush machine a noise suppressor a wireless at least one yeah two or three effects units a power amp power conditioner at the bottom spaghetti junction around the back mm. and so you need a tech yeah not only that you're dealing with this massive problem that is instrument and line level. Yes. Because all effects loops are not created equal as well. So if you're doing it like this, there are other things to consider as far as... Now, I, I was doing some tests with my, my matchless the other day. I was getting 30 volts out of the effects loop. What? It was unbelievable. We thought... I plugged something in, I'm going... 30? It sounds 30 volts. 30 volt swing. Wow. You know, if you consider that... Um, Instru uh, line level really should be about specific, like a volt technically, you know, maybe up to four, but the matchless, because the way it works, because it's all about the 
and it's only on the Dirty channel as well, the matches the EF86 channel. But that sound is all about how hard yeah, that yeah, EF86 yeah. channel slams into the power amp. Yeah. It's like we're measuring it. It's like we couldn't believe it. It's just yeah, amazing. Don't, don't, so, get, don't get confused between volts and um, dB, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Just, just this massive, yeah. a massive amount of signal. And lots of um, effects have trouble dealing with large signal. So you have all those considerations as well. Exactly that. And that's why people like Bob Bradshaw, I guess Pete Cornish, you know, the Al early... Dumble. Yeah. Yeah. The early pioneers of complex effects systems for pro guitar players yeah. came about because, you know, your average guitar player wasn't really able to be thinking about all that stuff yeah. and do the gig and maintain the rig and all of that. So as glorious as it can sound and it really can sound glorious yeah. and does it's not it's not all peaches and cream no it's very hard to live with plus of course music changed so you know what happened through the 90s there yeah uh, people were just plugging directly in, in their amps and going yeah. actually this is good yeah we like this cuz bon jovi and white snake and dokken turned into Pearl Jam, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Oasis. Yeah, and, in, and in terms of popular music, and probably Nirvana. Yeah, uh, probably you know had it the, perhaps arguably lest we forget Nirvana. Indeed, indeed, and those sounds would you know yeah st straight into his Crank Marshall and my friend was in the studio directly after they recorded In Utero. Oh wow! I went in the same studio directly after that. Yeah, no way. And um, I set a, a lot of stuff up, and yeah, anyway. Bonkers. Cool. So if we if we then say, well, okay, so there were lots of reasons why that approach to wet, dry, wet and huge racks fell out of favour a bit. Mm. We then go through all those very stripped down applications of guitar sound. And don't get us wrong, you know, in the studio, nothing was any different on any of those bands we just mentioned. There was still a ton of post effects Absolutely. and delay and reverb and all of that. Yeah. They didn't go dry. It just, they perhaps weren't doing it in a live environment quite in the same way. Mm. So then we, we arrive at, we, you know, we spill out the end of all of that as you do. And you look back and you go, wow, those guitar sounds were really cool. The problem I've got now is I've got this massive pedal board full of delays and choruses and reverbs and all of that. Mm. And I wonder if the birth of multi-effects had something to do with this. And you shove it all into one amp and it just sounds like a flipping mess. You know, it can do depending on the amp. But if, if what you're trying to do is get your amp to a place where it's really happy and limiting and mm. producing all those lovely amp harmonics, then you've got a real challenge on your hand. Trying to get this stuff. Yeah. Pr producing that fidelity. Yeah, yeah, I mean, loads of you will absolutely relate to that, where you get into pedals for a while, you've got too many pedals, it just sounds like mush. You get all the problems with signal routing, you yeah, get yeah. tone suck, you get all the same problems they have with the racks, just in miniature. <laughs> <laughs> Keep folding this. And then... <laughs> so then you're like, oh, I just want to go back to using my amp. Well, that's kind of how you introduce me mm. to what we call TPS wet dry. Indeed. Which is? Shall we show the good people? We will. I think we'll have a final listen to this because it just sounds so epic. <laughs> it does. And then the next thing you'll hear after this epicness is TPS wet dry. So we sort of have to remember a kind of similar thing to play. Okay. Good sir. All right. Thanks, Dan. It's been single coils all the way. We like to keep the humbucker people happy. Almost in tune.
What's happened? Okay, pedal board's got simpler. Much simpler. I've covered the amp that's not working. I like that. So no one's confused. We've got rid of the power amp and we've replaced the power amp with uh, another guitar amp, which Indeed. is on top of one of the caps. So yeah. just two guitar amps now. And signal wise, Dan? So the guitar is going directly into the uh, J Rocket HRM. From that, we're going into the splitter, the humdinger, and we're splitting the signal. One side is going directly into the input of the Cali Tweed. The other side goes into the Ernie Ball volume pedal. From there into the uh, waterfall, from there into the delay, and from there into the reverb, and from there into the input of our second amplifier. Give you a quick demonstration of that because the important difference between this and the wet, dry, wet, how we had it before is that both amps now are both seeing the dry signal. They're both seeing the guitar. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They're seeing the overdrive, both seeing the overdrive pedal. They're both seeing the, the dry signal. Exactly yes. that. Or to put it another way, the overdrive, the straight overdrive signal is going through all the pedals in series indeed not being fed back to them in parallel from a preamp exactly and the pedals are affecting each other yeah right so the vibrato is going into the delay which is then going into the reverb yeah so we'll give you a quick listen to um what's coming out of the two separate amps <laughs>
So, you heard it clearly, the descriptions on screen will have explained what's happening. Now, it's not totally simple, but it's nowhere near as complicated as wet, dry, wet. No. You only need, well, either two amp spaces wide or, how I do it, one vertical cab with wet and dry an inch speaker. Mm -hmm. Your stage space is massively reduced. You have control over the relative wetness of everything. Indeed. I mean, you do in wet, dry, wet as well, but it's slightly more finickety. Here you can just blend in the Ernie Ball volume pedal is doing the volume to the, the wet amp. Not only that, you can tell the sound engineer. Go to town, don't you like? Don't worry about it, geese. Yeah. Part, pan them straight down the middle. Yeah. I don't need any left, right cobblers. Everyone, no matter where they're stood in the venue, is going to be able to hear it. Now, you do forego stereo delay. You do. And you stereo uh, reverb if you're using that. So mm -hmm. but if you wanted that, you could have a third amp well, you know, or, and do stereo Or that again, way. you can do it if you have a device such as GigRig G3, for example, you can have stereo. You can yeah. use one of your loops of stereo and have stereo reverb mono modulation. So it's totally possible. But it's simpler. Yeah. Does it match the epic expanse of true wet, dry, wet? Probably not. No. It does give you something else, though, which I personally really love. Suits my personal playing style better. Sure. The general all-round kind of normal rock and blues playing, which is what I spend my life doing. Yeah. Americana. It, this is, I would say, far better. Sure. To, to, for my needs than full wet, dry, wet. Mm. So it's... What you're saying before about the difference is both amps are now receiving yeah. the direct signal. And what the, for me, this thing happens, and you can get it with almost any two amplifiers, yep. as long as they are analog, as in there's no latency with one amplifier. Yep. Any two amplifiers, you get this coupling thing that happens. And for me, it's where I know a lot of people have found their own sound by experimenting with a couple of different amplifiers on yeah. What we've got here, because we've got one amplifier that's sort of on the edge of limiting and we can dig in, it sounds amazing. I mean, the fire out, that's like the best I've heard that Kelly Tweed, just what a killer amp. But with the Victory, we've got a lot more headroom in there. Yeah. And so we can feed that all the effects and that sort of stuff. Yeah. But we still have that, the Kelly sort of poking yeah. through. I, I find, personally find it easier to just balance up the gain levels and volume levels of the two amps just as much fun with two Fender Pro Juniors as it is two big amps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let us let it be said that there are other ways to do wet, dry, wet, right? So you don't have to split the signal as we did from the effects loop of the amp. Dan probably said this earlier, but I'm going to say it again. There have been occasions where people split it before it hits any of the pedal boards. So they'll take a direct feed and go off to... Mm. Well, anywhere you could send it after a direct feed. Yeah. Either into something like a Strymon Iridium. Yep. A reamp. That's uh, so a recording to reamp it later. Yep. Yeah, straight yeah. into front of house. So there are many, 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 many ways. You can you can approach all of the signal routing. What we've shown you today is is two examples thereof. <laughs> Does he say at the end of that? I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. <laughs> Uh, Police Academy for those of you who, who, uh, who, are, who are getting a bit lost there. Yeah, I mean, so um, just before we, we conclude, because it is interesting, we love doing this. Mm. Two more things I want to try. I want to add. So what are we, where are we now then? We are, if what we had before was wet, dry, wet. Yes. What we have now is dry, wet, dry. Yes. Don't we? Dry, damp. Yeah. Yeah. What I want to do now is both of these amps have onboard reverb. Ah, very good. Let's forget the reverb pedal on the board. Let's try some amp reverb 
And then I'm just going to vary the gains on the amp a little bit so nice. we get the amps crunching a bit and we'll see how that works just for the halibut. Nice. Yeah. Lovely. Am I gesticulating enough, Daniel? Indeed. Indeed. I appreciate you. This is not sign language. Right. Come on then.
I, I love that sound. I love that. I love them both, right? They're both so much fun. I love the sound of those two amps together. Yeah, that's really, really great. Me too. I, I, I personally prefer it for the style of music that I would normally play. I find it easier to deal with. What I did there was um, while Dan was playing, I got the amps a bit gainy. So you were hearing overdrive from the amps, started pushing the front end a bit, turning down the master volume. So the amps themselves were overdriving, added the HRM on top of that and then came back from that to make it clean at the end. Mm. Various combinations of on. Yeah. Amp reverb or the Topanga right at the end. Yeah. Hard to go past the fun factor yeah. of the wet, dry, wet. This, you know, it's like 80s tastic. I could feel my hair growing back. Yeah. You know, it was, it's so much fun. It is. It, and it is colossal. You, yeah. You'll hear in your headphones how colossal it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm very happy with this. So did we get wet, thing. dry wrong, Dan? Was the, uh, the, the title of the video? Um, what is it? You were right. I was less right. Um, that's from a, a, a kid's cartoon film. I what I, anyway, Mega Mind. Mega Mind. Oh, okay. Um, um, yeah, look, I'm traditionally, that is how you would do wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet. How we with the effects yeah. in parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And not in the dry signal. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But I think what we're saying is, for the kind of playing most of us do most of the time, for the amount of tech uh, investment required, ease of use, reality of playing gigs, mm. it's this every day for me. Yeah. Every day of the week. Now, there may be those of you who say, well, this is totally ridiculous. I get an amp, a cable and a guitar. There are horses and there are courses. Indeed. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So what are we going to call it? Are we going to continue to call it TPS? Are we going to call it wet dry? Are we going to call it TPS wet dry? Are we going to call it wet damp? Are we going to call it dry wet damp? Um, are we going to call it dual mono? Yeah, but that's not right either. I don't know. Let's TPS wet dry. TPS one wet side's dry. wet, one side's dry. One side's kind you of know, damp. Yeah, kind of. It's like, <laughs> you know, you've done your load of washing, it comes out. Yeah. The spin's gone really well, but it's not, yeah. you know, you've still got some drying to do. I'm looking forward to all the comments that at length explain exactly what wet dry is. If you feel the need to do that, Philly boots, I think we explained it earlier on. If you feel the need to explain it in a different way, Philly boots. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. If you want to stand on a mountain and be right about it, even better, make a video and put it on YouTube. Great. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> well, that was fun. That it, was that was great fun. It was. Yes. Thank you so much for watching. Again, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Uh, a massive thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much, patrons and Patreon. Uh, we do our VCQ podcasts for you lot, um, which will go out every Monday. We also do regular patron giveaways. So if you are a TPS patron, look out in your inbox for emails about giveaways. Indeed. A massive thank you to anyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com. Please do. New things coming up. Yes. Some exciting new things coming up. So please go there, buy stuff. Um, it's the primary way we fund this show. Indeed. Uh, massive thank you to our preferred retailers in the UK and Europe. Anderson's Music of Guildford in Surreyshire. Yeah. I dreamt about Lee and Pete last night. It was really weird. Really? Yeah, in a completely like non-weird way. Okay. Right, yeah, very the, good. the dream itself was odd, but... There okay. Was no impropriety. We'll, oh, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, our dear friends in Australia. <laughs> Pedal Empire of Brisbane, Queensland. Matt, you'll be pleased to know I didn't dream about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And for all of our American friends. Yeah, go to thatpedalshop.com uh, where you can buy pedals and accessories and amps and stuff like that. Go there, buy stuff. Uh, they ship all over the US fast and free shipping for orders over a certain amount. Lots of nice things and some lovely editorial on there too. Indeed. Thatpedalshop.com. Lovely. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you on Monday for viewers' comments and questions where we can discuss. Where well, you can tell us this. you <laughs> really know what wet dry wet exactly. is. Exactly. Tell us how wrong we got it. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.